Welcome to a decade of off-road thrills. I'm Marty Reed, and in my work covering motorsports, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in Formula One, NASCAR, IndyCar, IMSA GTP, off-road desert racing, and the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix. And everywhere I've gone, people have asked me how stadium racing got started, and also they've made statements as to how exciting the action really is. Well, today we've got something special for you. Not just one race, but an entire decade of off-road thrills. Fasten your seatbelts. There's no sport as unique as off-road racing. Born in the desert, it attracted drivers who raced on treacherous terrain, through gullies, washouts, mud, and sand. But the excitement had no rippling effect. It belonged only to the drivers as they endured a race through Baja, Mexico, or competed on the desert stretches across America. The sport was officially organized in 1967, with a 950-mile race from Tijuana to La Paz to answer the question, what vehicle would be the fastest over the treacherous, rock-strewn trail? The race, open to all comers, had the approval of the Mexican government, and the event spread by word of mouth through the racing community. On November 1st, a catch-all assemblage of 68 different vehicles, buggies, motorcycles, cars, and trucks, gathered in Tijuana for the running of the Mexican 1000. The fastest vehicle, a dune buggy, screeched into La Paz in 27 and a half hours for an average speed of 34.45 miles per hour. That first race attracted an enormous amount of press coverage and firmly established off-roading as a bona fide motorsport. In 16 years, the sport has grown in stature and recognition. A major race may now attract 400 or more entries, and events are held in Baja, Mexico, California, Arizona, Nevada, and Texas. To help us with our tour of the decade of off-road thrills, there's no one better than Danny Thompson, the man who drives the Peak Chevrolet. Hey, Danny, good to see you. How you doing, buddy? Doing a little work on the truck? Yeah, just checking a couple of things out, making sure seat belts and everything are ready to go. The son of Mickey Thompson, and you and your father, you know, you raced off-road desert a long time before the dream of stadium ever took root. Oh, yeah, Marty, we started back in, it was about 1968, just getting out of high school and uh, went down there. My dad was driving for Strop, and that's when it was real primitive down there. There was no highways or anything else, and uh, it evolved into a lot more sophisticated sports since then, and we've been happy to be involved with it. Danny, what was it like uh, to see the sport of off-road stadium racing developing right before your very eyes? It's kind of unique, and, and you're exactly right, Marty, because it did develop before my eyes, and it all started with uh, a race that my dad and I were in, Baja 500. Bar Barnelli Jones was driving the big Ole Bronco, and my dad and him were having a heck of a race, and my dad kept yelling the whole time, somebody's got to see this, somebody's got to see this. This is the finest racing I've ever seen. And that's what developed into stadium, well, not, not particularly stadium, but the first part of short course racing, which involved uh, Riverside, and I think it was 1973. Let's go to where? It started. Uh, let's go to Riverside because uh, how did Mickey feel when he got off of racing into the international raceway? Well, it was a little bit funny. Les Richter uh, was there at the time, and my dad went out there and he told Les, he says, I'd like to stage an off-road race here. And Les was pretty concerned about hurting the pavement or anything because there had been a lot of good international road racing there. And my dad says, well, we'll run up along the side of that bank up there, and that was the ridge going up what is referred to as the S's. And Les says, you can't do that, and it's all ice fun. You can't run across there. My dad went out and got a pickup truck and made a bonsai run across there and hung on the side of that thing. Les Victor says, you bought yourself a bank full of ice plant and you now have a race here. <laughs> Danny, Riverside was a dream come true for your dad, but your memories of that track are a little more hairy than dreamy. What happened out there? Yeah, Marty, it was kind of unique. My dad had been working on some shock absorbers. He was a shock absorber genius and we'd been working this new trick combination out and it was the first year with our Chevrolet S10 there. And we had those shock absorbers working so good and there was a set of six bumps and everybody was crawling through there about 15, 20 miles an hour. And in the morning session, I had made it across there just about flat out. It was a little bit too hairy of a ride, but I figured you either got to slow way down or speed up a little bit. And I figured about 10 more percent would put it across there nice and smooth. Well, I went 15 percent and uh, the ending result was not too good. I think it was end over end four times, sideways, broke my arm, and uh, it was pretty hairy. But that was just one of many that's happened at Riverside. That's a flat out place and uh, the competition's intense there. The beginnings were in Riverside, but the turning point was the L.A. Coliseum in 1979. That night, before 40,000 fans, off-roading became as much spectacle as sport when Mickey Thompson combined entertainment and competition. The Celebrity Jeep race attracted such stars as Lou Rawls, Bruce Jenner, and Vicky Carr, just to name a few. The professional drivers included Rick Mears, who later went on to win the Indianapolis 500. 
The crowd loved every minute of it, and Thompson's instincts were right on target. Off-roading was not only exciting competition, but thrilling entertainment. Desert racing had come to town. Danny, in the early days, it was a lot of fun, but it actually did bring in a whole new set of technological advances. Stadium racing did that. When, when we first started stadium racing in 1979, everybody kind of pulled their cars in out of the desert, camped out there, and the first race was a two-day event, a Friday night and a Saturday night event. And we had so many cars running that we had to split it like that. But it was there again, it was desert technology that came to the stadium, and pretty soon it opened up a field that was unbelievable. The technology, not that the technology in the desert wasn't already great, but it started a whole new group that you had to go for you know, 10 minutes of flat out driving rather than 10 or 15 hours of 80% driving. So it, it involved into some technology that now is just, it's become unbelievable. One thing a lot of fans may not realize that back in those early days, the Grand National Sport Trucks were not king of the hills. Take me over to one of the Super 1600s where you started, if I sure. remember. We'll take a look at them. Danny, these were the king of the sports back in the early days, the Super 1600s. This is where it all evolved from, Marty. These cars were the absolute cat's meow. The fastest and continue to still be the fastest. They're still faster than the Grand National Sports Truck. Not by much, but a little bit. And the technology is just overwhelming. I, I was going to bring that up because you mentioned before that, that in the early days, of course, everybody just brought their desert vehicles. Right. Give me some of the technological advancements that have taken place over a decade. Well, Marty, we got these shock absorbers now. They're really technical now. And they got what they call accumulators on them so they can have a lot more wide band of adjustment. Engines have really come a long ways to where we normally had, oh, 70, 80 horsepower in some of these things, and now some of these guys are up to 300 horsepower in a car that only weighs 1,500 pounds. The one thing you notice when you see these cars on TV, the suspension is a lot stiffer. It's a lot rougher ride than what you guys end up with in the Grand National Sport Trucks. Yeah, that's, that's part of the problem. They run a real stiff front suspension, and part of the reason is uh, if you notice how quick they turn, it's their turning brakes. And turning brakes are really an important thing to come in here. These cars will bounce. The front ends will actually bounce a little bit in the ground, and you'll see the guys get in the corner, and they have what they call a J-brake in uh, stunt driving where they pull a handle one way and only one wheel will lock up and it gets the cars right into the corner real nice and makes them go around those corners quick. I wish we could do that in the trucks. <laughs> Speaking of the trucks, let's head that way because that's the king of the sport today. That's what we like. Well, we're back at Grand National Sport Trucks and without a doubt, Danny, these are the kings of the sport today. This is what everybody comes out to see in the final analysis. But you talked about technological advancements in the Super 1600s. These things are phenomenal. If you took all the body parts off, you wouldn't recognize it. Oh yeah, these trucks are amazing, Marty. Now that we have Chevrolet involved, Toyota, Nissan, Jeep, whenever you have factory support, you're talking about a lot of advancement, a lot of pressure, and the technological advancements are absolutely amazing on this car. This particular car right here has 20 inches of front wheel travel, and it can turn 45 degrees in one direction. Is there a way that you could equate the technological advances with, say, Indy cars? I think so, Marty. Indy cars, you can see a lot of their advancements on the exterior of the car. You got their swoopy little fuselages, or the tubs as they call it. You have their wings, you have the under trays. Now, we have the same amount of technology in one of these trucks, but ours is in suspension, not aerodynamics. Our top end speed never gets high enough to do aerodynamics, so we concentrate on suspensions. This particular car has 20 inches of wheel travel and turns at 45 degrees. Now to package something like that is an incredible feat. The thing that always amazed me was you could drop one of these from a three-story building and still be able to drive away. And not hurt your back. <laughs> well, maybe not your back, but <laughs> certainly mine. And, and that brings us to our next topic because we want to talk about safety features and I know you're going to probably put me to work in this, so <laughs> I'm going to get, get rid of this if that's okay with you. Uh, Marty, let me take you into my office, show you some of the safety features we have in this truck. Let's we'll start off with where I sit in my office. It's a six-point seat belt. Now that's something that's a little bit unique. Most people use five. I use six because it pulls me into the car real tight. I pull these seat belts down so hard so they don't jar around in the car during the race. Now something else we've borrowed from the IndyCar technology is a breakaway steering wheel. Now this breakaway steering wheel, in case you have to get out real quick or in case another car gets in on you, real quickly up with one hand steering wheels off and right out of the way so you can make a quick exit the last feature in this part of the office is a safety net we have it right here it goes up like this keeps your hands from getting hit well the one thing for sure it's nothing that we see in the showroom never a dull moment marty well, we are ready gary scheimer our official starter for the series gives the green flag and we are underway we should point out roger mears did not make heat number two 
Oh, a and, lot of bumping and banging going on. Oh, Danny Thompson gets up on two wheels, but he saves it. And Robbie Gordon has tried to move into third place already. Danny Thompson has lost the left front quarter panel on his truck. It is Glenn Harris in the General Tire Mazda, followed by Iron Man Ivan Stewart in the Toyota. Going inside now. And that is Dave Ashley, and you get a view of what he is seeing. He is back in uh, sixth place right now, and in front of him is Frank Archiero Jr. Look at the action. Look at how he's got to shift and then move. Now, the Toyota. Oh, oh! And there goes Ivan Stewart up and over. And quickly, a full course yellow comes out. Well, that's the second time tonight for Ivan to go over. He went over in qualifying on his first lap, so he's got a pretty live truck out there. Now, watching this restart, Marty, how Glenn Harris protects his lead. He'll do things like short break people. Right there, he took short break Danny Thompson and gave him a big advantage. And there you are inside with David Ashley, and David takes us through turn number one. That is Frank Archiero Jr. right in front of him. Up and over, and there we, we go back out front. Glenn Harris holds up. Danny Thompson down into turn three. The Mazda doing very well right now. In third place is Robbie Gordon. He won heat number one tonight in the Grand National Sport Trucks in his very first time out in this category. Now, there's no rear view mirrors in these trucks, so the drivers theoretically don't know what's behind them. But I tell you, Glenn Harris must have eyes in the back of his head. Meanwhile, there with four laps remaining, going past our mountain camera, is our top three vehicles, Glenn Harris, Danny Thompson, and Whoa! Robbie Gordon. No doubt about it, the crowds really turn on to the trucks, but there are a lot of other classes that make up the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix. The Grand National Sport Trucks are made up of domestic and imported mid or mini-sized pickups. Maximum engine displacement is 2,850 cc's. Speeds can reach in excess of 125 miles per hour if the straightaway is long enough. Designed and built for stadium courses, they currently cost between $100,000 and $175,000. Now the ultra stocks look like funny cars, but there are fiberglass shells over a sophisticated race car. Ultra stocks are thrilling to watch because they have the sleekness of a sports car and the wild appetite of an off-road racing machine. 
Now you never know what the Super 1600s are getting into with their unique open wheel design. They're stripped down for action. No doors, fenders, passenger seats. They're rugged. They cost between thirty and sixty thousand dollars. Plenty of participation in this class, meaning lots of traffic and lots of action. Now the four-wheel ATVs are wild to ride and wild to witness. Four-wheel ATV drivers straddle the seat, using arms and legs for shock absorption, shifting the body for speed and cornering. Anyone on these machines hardly ever sits down during the course of a race, and when this 250cc machine encounters the slightest bump, drivers are pitched in the air and the crowd brought to their feet. Stadium Superlights, also known as Odysseys, are a crowd favorite at the Mickey Thompson events, and no wonder, you never know where their annex will take them. These $20,000 machines are mini single-seaters with a fully independent suspension system, disc brakes, automatic centrifugal clutches, a sturdy steel tubing frame, and a super-tuned 360cc two-stroke motor. They may be a scaled-down version of the big guys, but the Superlights have a big appeal. And finally, there's Ultra Cross. These are the 250cc pro motorcycles, and the riders ride the race course in reverse, beating bumps at right angles and launching themselves high into the air. The heights they reach are incredible, up to 30 feet, and so are the speeds. Fastest drivers start at the back, identified by streamers on their helmets. The crowds go crazy as they come flying through the pack. Ultra Cross 250cc motorcycle racing is high intensity action, start to finish. Danny, in all the classes, what is it that drivers fear most? Why do you think it'd have to be fire? Fire is something that's so hard to control and it comes out of nowhere. It comes so suddenly and your reaction time involved in a fire has to be so, so quick. For instance, you're in the middle of a racing situation, you got traffic on all sides, you go, fire breaks out. First it fogs your vision, you can't see where you're going, you have to be able to pilot the thing to, to somewhat of a stop in somewhat of a safety type manner. Then you have to have a clear enough head to hit what we call a fire bottle, which is a halogen bottle that, that smothers the fire at. Then you have to get into your seatbelt, get those off, get the steering wheel out, and then exit the car and making sure that you don't exit the car in front of oncoming traffic. So there's a whole lot of things that happen in a very short period of time. Dave Ashley in the 1989 season had a very bad fire, which was captured, ironically, on the in-car camera. Yeah, his, his situation was very unique. And there again, it completely engulfed the inside of the car, making it hard to see, but Ashley with quick reaction time and that fire bottle that actually saved the whole day and got out of the car uh, safely. And Ashley doing a fight. You can see his hood is uh, flapping in the breeze, but uh, unless it comes up in his face, he will not have to stop. Oh, we got oh, fire. Ashley's David on fire. Ashley, he is on fire in the middle of the course. We have got fire on the mountain, and they pulled the fire extinguisher, Marty, and put that thing out. That was trouble all over the place, and Ashley jumps out of the car. Ashley does a super job of maintaining his cool, getting the fire put out, and uh, miraculously, he is okay. Let's go back to the moment, which is probably the most frightening for any driver, and that's when fire erupts in the cockpit. Now, this is David Ashley, and this is what it looks like from the inside. You can see the flames licking his suit, and this gets hot, folks. Luckily, the safety equipment required by the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix, just as strict and stringent as any other form of motorsports in the U.S. today, and he pulls the fire bottles that are on board this machine and quickly extinguishes the flames, and David came out of this without having a hair singed on his body. The fire suit and the fire extinguisher did its job. From safety to performance, the drivers on the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix are on the leading edge of technology. From onboard computers to sheer performance, these drivers have got it all.
so far we've talked a lot about the driver's role in this sport of stadium racing, but there are a lot of other guys behind the scenes that make it all go. Yeah, Marty, you're right. It takes about probably 90% preparation work for 10% driving time. And those are the people that really make it all happen. My guy is Mike Donovan. He comes from Formula One, Indianapolis cars, IMSA cars, and now he's into this. So he's brought a lot of that technology in, into our sport. And it's, it's so much that everything has to be done so right because you don't have time for a pit stop in this form of racing. So everything has to be exactly prepared right down to an, a T once we leave that start line because you've got 10 minutes and you better have it all together. It's a lot of fun. Come on out. Bring the fam. <laughs> Bring the fam. Oh, it's so awesome. Great. In fact, he looked unbeatable. But now, going into Pontiac, Mike Kudrowski is in that number one spot. Is it rolling? Okay. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ivan Stewart. Come see. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ivan Stewart. Come see. God, dang, what am I trying to say here? I'm glad I don't own that truck. If you want to see a real truck win, come out and watch my Jeep. I don't know. Hi, I'm Danny Thompson. I'm the Iceman. Come watch the Iceman come up. <laughs> I can't believe how high they go. For the girls. <laughs> Definitely for the girls. <laughs> I'd have to say, the girls. <laughs> okay, my favorite driver is Danny Thompson. My favorite driver is Ivan Stewart. My favorite driver is Walker Evans. Bobby Gordon's my favorite driver. I haven't done this before, folks. <laughs> I can't believe how high they go. <laughs> the girls. Definitely the girls.
Anyone who has ever been to a Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix event has wondered how long and how much it takes to build one of these race courses. Well, to give you an idea, 800 truckloads of dirt are needed just to start with. Now, that equates to enough dirt to fill 400 average-sized backyard swimming pools. Then you've got the hydro barriers. Now, this was a design by Mickey Thompson himself. Instead of hauling in 8,000-pound chunks of concrete to every event, he brought in a hard plastic design that was hollow on the inside. It weighed 100 pounds each when it was empty, then fill it up with water for the race, lock them together with stakes. They each weigh 800 pounds, and they do a fantastic job of keeping the trucks on course where they belong. The most unique thing about the entire operation, it takes four days for 30 men to set up a race course, only three to tear it all down. Another element that has made this sport so interesting has been the development of the family concept. I mean, literally, brothers, fathers and sons, mm -hmm. everybody. Yep. There's a lot of us out there. There's uh, Roger Mears and Roger Mears Jr. Uh, there's Rob Gordon and Bob Gordon. Uh, we have the Volan brothers and motorcycles. Tyson uh, and Talon. Yeah. And then we have uh, Rod Millen and Steve Millen. So uh, we got a lot of variety there. A lot of family, a lot of rivalry comes out of families. Down the parasile for the last time at the Los Angeles Coliseum. Tyson Volan will make the same line through that far turn. He's calling his brother upside of him again, Marty. He's going to let him finish him near him. It is Tyson and Tolan Volan. And look at he does a wheel stand as he comes down the final stretch. And brother and brother again finish number one and number two. And I would imagine they'll go over and shake hands one more time, high-fiving each other on their bikes. I guarantee you, Kawasaki's going to be looking at some of those pictures to turn into some promotional spots because that's a, you, can't, you can't plan it better than that. I smell a poster. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this stuff is so exciting, and once you start it, you never want to quit, and you want to continue on, and, and I think you get, you get that into the family, and it all works in so tightly that you never want to leave it. Well, I can remember a time when there was a little episode between a couple of brothers. We'll take you back to Rod and Steve Millen, and uh, you be the judges whether or not blood is thicker than water. <laughs> Here he comes on the inside. Steve is right behind him. Brother against brother, Mazda against Toyota with two laps remaining. I guarantee you, if Millen is within bumper distance, there's going to be some pushing and shoving because Toyota wants this one badly. There's the white flag. One lap remaining. Rod Millen in the Mazda is the leader. Steve Millen in the Toyota is right behind him. And again, they are brothers. So it's Millen. Well, I say Millen. It's two Millens. And there's a dead car in the water. They have to negotiate around it. They do. They go through the whoop de doos or the bump. Here comes. Here comes. Look at Steve. Bang right into the brother in the Mazda. And Steve Millen pushes him into the barriers. And Steve Millen in a Toyota has taken over the lead. He says, I'm sorry, brother, but this is all business. And he sweeps around the far side. And there is the checkered flag for Steve Millen in a Toyota. Brother Rod in a Mazda finishes second in the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Grand Prix Championships, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. And a little tip of the hat to each of them saying, hey, brother, I'm just, I'm just doing my job. He said, Mama taught you better than that. <laughs> Well, let's go back to the past on the last lap. Steve Millen and Brother Rod, they're fighting for first place. The Mazda in front of the Toyota. Mazdas have won every single race on all four stops of the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Season Championship this year until this move. Steve manages to get the nose inside, slams the door shut on Brother Rod, forcing him to the outside. Look at the fans in the stands. They are just going crazy. And Steve knows from this point on, it's a Toyota victory. Uh, in regards to family and racing, the, the only sport that I can relate to bring a family together would be off-road racing, only because champ car racing, IMSA racing, stock car racing is a big business. Off-road racing allows us not only to take care of business and get the exposure for our sponsors, but to get our families involved. And they can come pit for us, they can help with the, with the cars, and it makes so much, it's so much nicer for us as the drivers or the people that are involved in the sport to be able to bring our families and have them with us so we're not away from them all the time. And with the schedule that we take, you know, you take 18 races a year, you're going to be gone a lot of weekends, especially in the desert because you're pre-running. And that happens the week before a race or two weeks before a race. So you're taking a lot of, a lot of time away from your family. And when the kids are young, it's very important that, that someone's there that they can, they can talk to and they can relate to. And this form of racing allows me to do that. And I tell you, if, if it was another form of racing, 
it would be real difficult to be able to be married, have a family, and also race. Whereas off this stadium racing and desert racing gives me that opportunity. And I thank God for it, because without it, I'd be in real deep trouble. You cannot attend a Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix without being struck by the carnival atmosphere. Everywhere you turn, there's something to see or do or, yes, even eat. Fans enjoy the pit lane access, the autograph sessions, the mini automotive trade shows. Why, there's even bands and, of course, plenty of souvenirs. It really is a total event in every way. And the goal of the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group is for everyone to leave feeling like they got their money's worth and more. Then there was 1989, and you've got Jeep versus Toyota. That's right. And it has really gotten, it's taken on a totally different flavor. That's right. I think it's been kind of billed as uh, the veteran versus the rookie, and uh, Rob Gordon coming in as a rookie and doing a very good job for Toyota this year. And I think they kind of thought they were going to take this veteran uh, Walker Evans out and put him out to pasture, but he's a pretty sly old fox, and he's been doing a heck of a job. And those guys have been at each other's throat all year long. That's what makes good competitive racing. I mean, it's not like one person's running away with the other one. Walker's right there, Robbie's right there, and the competition is just heady. There is your leader, Walker Evans, at 50 years of age. He will have four laps remaining, and look at Robbie Gordon is bringing him in. And this has been the twosome all year long, Marty. It's been dynamite. It's been explosive between these two, and I got no reason to believe it's not going to happen again tonight at the Rose Bowl. I'm seeing a little puff of smoke from the back of Walker Evans' Jeep, and oh, he bicycles it again. But the 50-year-old veteran trying to get around lap traffic of Dan Esslinger makes his pass. Robbie Gordon trying to get through. Now I'm trying to figure out. I, I don't know if that is radiator problems or if it is tire smoke from the rubbing. Whatever the problem, Walker Evans continues to show the way to the rest of the field. Robbie Gordon is really within striking distance now. And here comes Gordon. Will he get the inside? Oh, no! They hook tires catch the hydro barrier all at the same time and here we go again marty it's happening again uh, that one i don't think is gonna have whoa walker gets on the bicycle so does robbie this is the greatest racing of the season well mr clutch walker evans has it he's gonna look at a white flag come out there is one lap to go buckle up ladies and gentlemen a lot can happen with one lap walker evans shows the way robbie gordon running second these two have feuded and tangled all year long and let's watch what Here happens comes. with a half a lap to go robbie tries to get the nose in walker is doing letting him go by esslinger lets the two leaders fly by walker did a great job there of shutting the door on the inside here he comes robbie gordon had a chance to accelerate into the turn walker held him off he slams into the back fender walker continues to drive phenomenal driving look as they hook and walker evans will win sideways at the rose bowl in pasadena he pulls over he wants a piece of robbie gordon he can't believe he tried to take him out and a fantastic finish. Listen to the crowd. One of the elements that has made this series so fascinating and interesting to watch is the close fender-to-fender -fender action. Of course, sometimes some of those fenders have gotten a little closer than the drivers would have liked. One thing we'd like to point out as we show you some of the more spectacular accidents of the last 10 years is that not one driver was injured.
is no sport with such diverse fans, men, women, and of course children, from all areas of the country. The crowds are growing year by year. Today, a stadium event draws between 40 and 60,000 people, and an event broadcast on television typically attracts 4 million viewers. Quite an outpouring of support in 10 short years. And in the near future, off-roading will be debuting in stadiums in Japan. And we can only imagine how much these events will thrill the Japanese. Besides all the action of the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix, the entertainment group has complete events that include motorsports extravaganzas, mud bog racing, the famous and fabulous monster trucks, super cross action that dazzles the crowd and brings them to their feet, and sand drag racing. There are some drivers that we think you should keep your eyes on. People like Robbie Gordon, Dave Ashley, and Rob McCachran. And it put Robbie McCachran into the lead. Now it's McCachran, Roger Mears, and Robbie Gordon having the makeup crowd. Danny Thompson on a peak Chevrolet is fourth. And it's going to be a, a five car race as they try and catch back up from behind. All right, now here's where we're going to find out what Rob McCachran's made of. The Jeep people are very high on this young man. In the Desert Series, he is leading in the 7S standings. And he has got Roger Mears, one of the most experienced drivers right behind him, pressuring him, and he's only 21 years old. How is he going to respond? And he really pushes him through turn two. And Roger Mears with a big move. They collide in the rhythm section, and Roger Mears takes over first place. They blasted their way through the rhythm section, and Mears comes out on top through turn three. Came a little heavy through turn two, as you called it. He was right on a throttle just a little too hard. It's bicycling up high. Look out. And that's going to get second place to Robbie Gordon. Oh, and he powers through it somehow and over the jump and hangs on to second, but Gordon down in his tail and cuts inside. The inside line to Robbie, and yes, he'll take second place now. Whoa, are they cutting it hard. And Robbie pushed him hard. Robbie Gordon and Nama Cochran comes back on the inside. This, this is a, quite a race. This is some of the best driving I have seen from Rob McCachran on this stadium series all year long. I mean, he is going head-to-head -head with Robbie Gordon, and he's holding his own. Once again, there's your leader, Roger Mears, as they go through the rhythm section. There's your battle for second place with McCochran. And Robbie Gordon. And you know, that's oh, look at him. Here they go, leaning on, on, on each other. Oh, they are battling hard, and Robbie Gordon pushes his way through turn four, and then right back, here comes McCochran. Oh, what a race. Going at it again into turn one. McCochran kind of swings his rear end around in front of Gordon, and McCochran's taking second place. What a battle. I tell you what, McCachran ought to drive with a bad back all the time. I'm, he, this is spectacular. <laughs> Danny Thompson, the peak Chevrolet, could cause some problems. You see him stopped around that far side. We'll see if it does. Oh, McCachran no! rolled it. He rolled it. He did a 360 earlier. He did it again. And there's also some women in the sport who you need to keep your eye on. Mercedes Gonzalez. When you're out on the track, you got to realize that you're a racer. You're not a woman competing against guys. And whatever they do to you is part of racing. If you can't take it, you shouldn't be out there. So, and, and I try to give it back. I mean, they, they're, they're out there for a reason, and so am I. And, and you can't expect them to uh, leave the, the doors open for me just because I'm a woman.
Marty, the one thing nice about off-road racing is, is it has no barriers. Whether you're on the podium at the victory stand, it's talking about how nice it was to win, whether you're upside down in the fence, whether you didn't make it to the start line, whatever it is, we have something for all the fans. And it doesn't matter what country it's being played in. No, it doesn't. We hope we've got your blood pumping just a little bit more and that you've enjoyed our decade of off-road thrills. For my partner, Danny Thompson, I'm Marty Reed. So long for now. Want the best seat in the house for motorsports entertainment? The Diamond P Sports is your ticket for excitement. With over 35 spectacular titles from which to choose in the growing Diamond P inventory, you can build a home video library of your favorite motorsports action that you'll enjoy for years to come. For the drag racing enthusiast, Diamond P annually presents the entire NHRA championship season in review. You get all the dramatic action as the best drivers chase the elusive NHRA championship crown. For an exciting and comprehensive look at recent drag racing history, there's Decade of Thrills 1 and 2, examining the most chilling, agonizing, and emotion-filled moments of the 70s and 80s. Funny car fans can't get enough of fabulous floppers 1 and 2. The sound and excitement of Pro Stocks takes the stage in Hot Rods from Detroit. And Top Fuel is what's hot in Kings of the Sport. Interested in personalities? Well, Diamond P presents these legends in Garlets 1 and 2, Don Prudhomme, and Shirley. If it's monster trucks, mud racing, and tractor pulling that cranks you up, then Shake, Battle, and Roll, and Shake, Battle, and Roll 2 are for you. For sprint car fans, the unpredictable winged world of outlaws are featured at the famed Knoxville Nationals. Beginning with Knoxville 87, you can get the entire collection of annual mayhem. And fasten your seatbelt for a treacherous journey up, over, and off-road. Takes you from the Baja Desert to outrageous stadium racing and a decade of off-road thrills. Plus, don't forget about Supercross. It's an aerial dogfight for these two-wheel warriors as they fuel the intensity for light to the finish. For the truck enthusiast, you can't beat the three-volume set entitled The Truckin' Trilogy. From the Truckin' USA series, you get all the best trucks, competition locales, and trick trucks, quick trucks, and freewheel in America. And finally, to complete your library, it's the best-selling series of And They Walked Away, volumes one and two, and the latest, And They Walked Away three. Here are the most breathtaking moments from the Diamond P archive. Racing's most spectacular spins, flips, wrecks, and fires. And in each perilous incident, the driver beats the odds. To order any of these terrific videos, or to receive a full-color catalog detailing all the titles available, just call 1-800-421-0725 or write to the address on your screen. Diamond P Sports. We make motorsports come alive. <laughs>